if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn again to Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, we've been looking at this little portion for a while, uh, and really uh, it's dealing with the Word of God. And I suppose the important thing for us in these days to be, is to be reading God's Word and to be able to understand the Word of God. The Word of God uh, is not relevant if we can't understand what it's saying to us. And we trust that God will take His Word and that God's God will, will, will help us to understand that Word through the work of the Holy Spirit. So Nehemiah chapter 8, there's a number of names in this we've been reading together. And, uh, uh, and yet there's really from beginning to end of chapter 8, Nehemiah is expounding the word through the prophet and through the priest Ezra. And Ezra is taking that word and he's reading it out and he's giving it to the people. And then the people's response to that word Nehemiah chapter 8, and verse 1, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. That was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood, and folks, there we have a list of names. I've read them the last two Sundays. And I'm sure you know them all by now. So we're going to go down to the beginning of verse 5. And you can read through those names yourself. It's important, all these names. But really what it's saying here is these men stood up and they stood with him. Some on the left, some on the right. And stood with him as he preached the word forth. And that's the important thing. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces towards the ground. And we have a list of men here in, in verse 7 who helped him expound the scriptures to them. And down to the end of verse 7, it says there, And the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershata, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great myrrh because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And verse 13 is our final verse. And it says, On the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And we'll finish the reading of God's word there at the end of verse 13. And we trust it will be a blessing to us and as we bring a few thoughts uh, later on. Thank you. 
Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you afresh this morning for the privilege just to be able to meet here together. We thank you for the little thought to the boys and girls, and we pray, Lord, it'll be a blessing and just a challenge to us all. And we do pray, Lord, in the day and age we're living in where many people do not look to the Word of God or, or do not read the Word of God. We pray, Lord, that the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ will be seen in and through our lives and the way we live them. So, Lord, just help us now as we turn to your Word Open up your word to us. Make it a blessing. Make it a help. Make it a real challenge. Make it just a word in season that will minister to us because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me uh, there to Nehemiah chapter 8. And we've been looking really the last number of weeks at God's word. And we looked at Ezra and we looked at all that Ezra went through there last week and how that Ezra was qualified to handle the scriptures how that he was a man who had stickability and dependability. He'd been there over the years. And we also looked at Ezra, uh, was, was his endeavor was to draw people back to God. And as we looked at Ezra, we looked at the wonderful way that he, that he lived his life and led his life and how that was an example. And then he was faithful in preaching and in lifting up the word to the people. And what I want to look at is a number of things regarding the word of God this morning. Because here, Ezra, he, he did a number of things with the Word of God. And, and I think it's important that we do the same as far as God's Word is concerned. And I want to look at a number of things. I quoted them just very quickly at the end of the sermon last week. But I want to bring them in a little bit more detail uh, this morning as we look to God's Word. Uh, the first thing that Ezra did, and as part of his ministry, he brought the Word. He brought the Word. And there in verse, in verses 1 to 4, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. First thing he did was he, he simply brought the book. Now what we're looking, you can read down through the time, but this was the first day of the seventh month. Uh, and in the Jewish calendar, I suppose, it was, it was the equivalent of New Year's Day. And sometimes I know myself when I'm, when I'm looking for a sermon for, for New Year's Day or the first Sunday, you, you look for a wee challenge and you look for a blessing and you look for something new and something fresh to give the people that as we go out into a new year, we're refreshed, we're enthusiastic, we're longing to go forward in our Christian life and in our Christian experience. And here right at the very beginning, he brought them a challenge. 
He brought them the word of God and he said, uh, I suppose as far as the nation was concerned, there was going to be a new chapter in their life and something new was going to happen. And maybe sometimes in our own lives, we've, we've gone through the mundane, we've gone through maybe a difficult year, we're maybe even going through a difficult time at the minute in our own Christian life and Christian experience. And as we go through them times, we long for something new to come. And we long for something fresh to come. And we long for God just to speak directly into our hearts and directly into our lives. And here Nehemiah was longing for, for a direct speaking into the heart and life of the individual. And maybe that's what you just need within your heart and within your life this morning for the Lord to come and for the Lord to speak directly into it. Maybe there's something wrong within your heart and within your life that only the Lord knows. Maybe there's, there, there's an unconfessed, un, un, uh, uncovered sin that's there within the heart and the life. Maybe nobody else knows. And, and folks, but you know, and you can't get past that and you can't get into a fresh and new experience with the Lord. Maybe there's a, there's a pull from the world that's saying, listen, go this way instead of going God's way. And the world is pulling you in, in its own way and in its own sway. And God is saying to you, listen, I want to do a fresh thing. And I want to do something new within your heart and within your life. Maybe there's a selfishness. Maybe you've decided, listen, I'm going to do it my way. Listen, I'm going to do it by myself. Can I say we can't accomplish anything without the Lord? And the first thing we need to do is simply come to him and allow him to do something new and something fresh. Maybe this morning you've lost the real joy of your salvation. Maybe you can look back to a time when you came to the Lord and there was a real joy. There was, there was something new. There was something fresh. You love going to the Word. You love to be in the company of the people of God. You love to see something new and something fresh happening. And now it's just the mundane and you're just going through the Christian life and the Christian experience. You know, God says in His Word, He said, I will restore unto you the real joy of your salvation. He said, I will restore unto you the years the locusts have eaten. And that's what ne Nehemiah and Ezra long for the people here, that something new would happen within their heart and within their life. And maybe that's what you long for. And you know, folks, this morning you can cry out to a God who hears, and you can cry out to a God who wonderfully answers. You can cry out to one who says, who, who says to us, listen, I will restore unto you. I will make it anew. I will give you that joy. I will give you that sense of accomplishment. I will give you that new life in Christ. He will do something new for you. What was the book of the law? Simply here, the book of the law was the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, through to Deuteronomy. And sometimes they're, 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 they're maybe difficult reading in some ways and difficult to understand. But that's the very foundation of the scriptures. And what Ezra was saying here, listen, I'm writing down your very foundation, what you're going to be able to stand upon. And can I say this morning, we can stand upon the word of God because the word is able to be stood upon because it's truth from beginning to end. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. This is God's word to you and me. He read the very foundation. You know, we're living in a world today where, where we hear a lot about evolution. We hear a lot about the Big Bang Theory. We, we hear a lot about a lot of things, don't we? But the scripture is very clear when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we have creation. And then we have the wonderful, the wonderful way he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. We have the wonderful way through the Old Testament into the New Testament when Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. And folks, right throughout the canon of Scripture, we have the foundation. You take away the first five books of the Bible, you, you, the whole Bible falls. And that's why Ezra read the first five books of the Bible, because you can stand upon them. Can I say, our life can always stand upon the Word of God. You see, folks, can I say this morning very clearly, and I'm not saying this in any flippant way, but sometimes people uphold the Word of God. They're very quick to argue the Word of God. They're very quick to, to, to say that the Word of God is God's Word. But they never get to the place of truly worshiping the God of the Word. And folks, sometimes we can argue so much about the Word and what the Word says and what the Word doesn't say that we miss the main emphasis. The Word of God draws us to God. The Word of God draws us to God. 
And folks, when you read the Word of God, do you see God in the Scriptures? In the beginning, God. That's what it says. And the reality here, the very foundation he was bringing them to. And we always need to get to the foundation, to the fountainhead. We need to be worshiping God. You see, if we've come to worship the Word, we're going to go away empty. Because we need to get to the God of the Word the omniscient God, the all-knowing God, the, om the omnipresent God, the God who is everywhere present, the omnipotent God, the all-powerful God. That's exactly where we need to get to. And he read the five, first five books of the Bible because he gave them a foundation, and that foundation that can stand upon. And folks, if we believe the Word of God, if we've trusted in the God of the Word, can I say, then we have a foundation that we can build our life upon. There in verse 4, you will see he stood up on the, on the pulpit of wood. And, and I thought that was, that was interesting because uh, Ezra stood up for, for all to see, and he faithfully preached the word. And if we're looking at a land, if we're looking at a, at, at a fellowship, if we're, if we're looking in any situation, we, we need to stand up and we need to preach the word. And the word of God needs to be preached with power, and it, it needs to be preached with authority. You know, it was like, I suppose, an open-air service. It was like a drive-in service we were talking about. He, he stood up on the pulpit for all to see, and then he proclaimed the Word of God. He went out to the people with the Word. And it's not the great challenge to you and me as far as the Word of God is concerned. Not only to hear it, not only to, to live our lives upon it, not only to have the fragrance of it, but as we go out, to, to live it out to those who are out. You see, the Word of God needs to be taken to the people. And God's word shall not return unto him void. That's the great commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, the one thing that came to my mind, I was thinking in this thought there last week and this week, was, was, was John Wesley's word. And he said, you know, he said this, he said, the world is my parish. The world is my parish. That's the same challenge to the church today. And I was interested now, you know me, I don't look up computers. I'm no good at them at all. I got Kathy to look it up for me. And you know, it says, does anybody know when he said that? Now, I didn't know, but I, I got Kathy to look it up. Google can do anything for you, you know, folks. It's a great job. He said it on the 11th of June, 1739, nearly 180 years ago. And it's still the same message today, isn't it? The world is our parish. And the great challenge to us is to go. And the great challenge to us is preach the gospel. You know, he brought the book. He brought the book. Never be ashamed to bring the book. And never be ashamed to preach the book and the word of it. The second little thing is that, is that he opened up the book. There in verses 5 and in verses 6, Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. And when Ezra opened up the book, he read it. And the people there were seated in the square. But if you read down through verses 5 and verses 6, you will see there that the one thing they did, they, they, they stood up when the word of God was being read. They stood up. You see, what can I say? There was a reverence to the reading of the word of God. And sometimes, you know, folks, there's very little reverence sometimes with people even when they're speaking about God. Sometimes there's very little reverence when people are dealing with the things of God. And remember, when we're dealing with the things of God, we're dealing with holy things. We're dealing with sacred things. We're dealing with important things because we're dealing with, with the things that concern our God. And we should never make light of them. And here there was a reverence. There in the square, with one accord, they all stood up as the word of God was read. And folks, there they listened to the Word of God. Can I say it wasn't man's Word? And this morning, this, this is not man's Word. This is God's Word. And it's God's Word to you. And it's God's Word to me. If you go down to verse 7, it tells on us that the people remained standing while the Word of God was read and while the Word of God was explained. Go back to verse 3, and you'll see it tells us that he started in the morning and he continued till midday. He read and explained the word for five or six hours. 
Boys, that gave me some challenge. I thought to myself, boys, if I could preach a sermon now for five or six hours, how many hands up any of you would still be here? I thought that, good man, Roy. At least you're making it look kind of good anyway. You know, five or six hours. I thought to myself, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that some time for the people to sit and listen? But you know, when people are gripped by the word of God and by God, time goes out the window. You know, the world has programmed us time-wise, hasn't it? You know, every five minutes is counted for, every half an hour is counted for, every hour is counted for, every day is counted for. You know, what did the people do here? They stopped. Five to six hours, and they just sat, and they listened or stood and listened to the Word of God. Now, I don't know whether they stopped the times. I don't know whether they went away to get a cup of tea. I don't know. I just thought five or six hours, how were they able to do it? But they were gripped by the word. And for five or six hours, they sat and they listened to God's word of God. If you go back on to verse 18, it said this went on for a full week. A full week of ministry meetings sitting under the precious word of God. Oh, that that would come today. That we'd see a people sitting under the word of God. Not wanting to move. I remember listening to Mr. Lewis, who I trained under. Many of you will know him. Uh, and I remember sitting listening to him, and he said, You know, Mervyn, he said there was a time of blessing came into a little church where he missioned, uh, where, where he was pastor of there in, in Scotland. And he said, During that time, he, 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 said, he said, God came in amongst us. And he said, Time went out the window. He said, I never prepared a sermon. He said, I stood up and God gave me the word. And he said, I preached it. He said, a half an hour went into an hour. An hour went into an hour and a half. An hour and a half went into two hours. And there was a longing among the people and there was a longing to meet around the word. And God wonderfully came. Time stopped. And he said, God took over. And folks, isn't that what we long for in the days we're, we're, we're living in? That God will come in power and authority with his word and speak into hearts and speak into lives. There in 1 Timothy, there in the NASB, the New American Standard Bible puts it like this. He says, give attention to the public reading of the word. You know, can I say give attention to the word in your life? Because that's how God speaks in. And that's how God wonderfully speaks through. Go back to verse 6 there. Ezra blessed the Lord. And I think it's wonderful there. The great God. The great God. You see, the word of God was listened to. But it was listened to reverently. And there it says that Ezra blessed the Lord. He lifted up the Lord. You know, sometimes we're longing for the Lord to bless us. But here it says, Ezra, Ezra blessed the Lord. The, the blessing was going to fall at the feet of his God. And I believe when the blessing falls at the feet of God, then it, can I say, it'll come and it'll fall into your heart and it'll fall into your life as well. But when God's blessed through his people, folks, can I say, then a blessing comes into our heart and a blessing comes into our life. One of my favorite little portions of scripture, and I, I have a number of books on it. I've got books for Christmas and all. I think, Coulter, you bought me a book on it one time years ago. But it's, it's, it's the prayer of Jabez there in, in, in Chronicles. And he said, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed. Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed. And you know, sometimes we forget that little O. Oh, but I believe the little O oh is, is the cry from the heart. Oh, that thou wouldst bless me. And I think, folks, what we need is, is the real cry from the heart, don't we? Because if the blessing, if God has a blessing, he's longing to outpour it upon our hearts and upon our lives. He's longing to outpour it uh, upon us ourselves. He's longing to outpour it upon our families. And he's longing to overpour it over his people. Folks, are are. Are we ready for it? Have we a desire for it? Have we a desire that God would come and bless us? Because he is. He is the great God. He is the great God. 
Can I say as we, as we move on, folks, what was the reply of the people? When God wanted to pour out a blessing, when Ezra wanted God to be blessed, what was the, the answer of the people to God? And what does our answer need to be? Because I believe it needs to be the very same. Go to verse 6 there. And it says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all. You notice it wasn't just one or two. But all of the congregation, all of the people answered, Amen, Amen. What does Amen mean? So let it be. Let it be. Let it be. And that's the great cry from your heart, and that's the great cry from my heart. Yes, Lord, let it be. May it be so. You see, they were united in the word. And can I say they were united by the word. They didn't worship the book here. They didn't worship the book. They were coming to worship the Lord through the book. And that's the difference. They were coming to worship the Lord, but they were coming to worship the Lord through the book. If you go into verse, verse 6, it says, And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads. And who did they worship? They worshiped the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. They didn't worship the book. God spoke to them through the book, but they were there to worship the Lord. Verse 6, you'll see there, they not only said Amen and Amen, but they also, they also lifted up their hands. They lifted up their hands. One of the commentaries I read during the week put it like this. It, uh, I thought it was lovely. It says, these are uh, enthusiastic believers lifted up their hands towards heaven as a token of their utter dependence upon God for all their needs. They lifted up their hands towards heaven in utter dependence upon God for all their needs. And folks, I wonder, are we lifting up our hands towards heaven? And I wonder, is it an utter dependence upon him for all of our needs? You know, the reality is for you and me this morning, and we know it. We can't work up an anxious thought. Sure we can. But our God can send it down. Our God can send it down. Now, I'm not saying you ever do this, but I did this a number of years ago when I was in Bible college. We were having a time of prayer. And I remember there was a man there and he was praying. He was, he was one of the lecturers there in the Bible college. And I remember listening to him praying for a long time. And I opened up my eyes to see him as he was praying. And all I could see was with his hands he was pulling. Pulling down the blessing of God. And folks, the great reality, I wonder, in our prayers is that's exactly what we're doing. We're lifting up our hands and we're pulling down the blessing of God that God will come and that God will bless us and that he will bless us indeed. You see, the psalmist in Psalm 121, that lovely psalm, it's one of my favorite psalms, but he says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? Isn't that right? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And folks, he is the great helper. I was thinking of, of the little thought, and, and, and while I was preparing and thinking of it the last number of weeks, I, I, I spoke about it there the other Thursday night in the prayer meeting. But, but he's our helper in the past. You know, as we look back, we look, to the, we look to the goodness of God, all he has helped us and brought us through and how he has blessed us in the past. Thou hast been my help, it says in Psalm 63. Thou hast been my help, so in the past he has helped us. You know, in the very present, he is our helper. The scripture says in Psalm 46, a very present help. And you know, no matter what you're going through even today, he's a very present help, isn't he? And he will carry us through. That's the wonderful thought that comes before us here. And he will be our helper in the future. The Lord will help me. And sometimes we think, well, how can we deal with the present? He's a very present help. And I love that verse because it says in a time of trouble, how clearer and how simpler can it be for you and me? 
And folks, as we look to the future, he says, I will be your help. In other words, it doesn't matter what's ahead. He will be our helper. And folks, he will bless us. Folks, we're lifting up the hands. And the help will come down. But it'll only come down when we need it. You know, sometimes when we're going through difficult times, we forget the lifting up of the hands, don't we? We forget the lifting up of the hands. He's a great God. There's nothing that he cannot do. And as we lift up those hands, the wonderful help will come down. I was thinking of that little chorus, He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. You know, folks, they're not only here said amen from the lips, from the hands, but here there was, there, was, there was a humility. They bowed the head, bowed the head. And folks, you know, God answers the prayer of the humble, doesn't he? The proud, he said, he sends away. You see, there was a humility here of the people. And folks, what does God long for you and me? He longs for us to be a humble, doesn't he? To come humbly before our God to come prostrate before our God, to come prayerfully before our God. And our God will hear, and our God will answer. You see, he not only brought the book, he opened up the book. He opened up the book. And thirdly here, my time is gone, but just give me a few minutes in closing, folks. He, he read and he explained the book. There in verses 7 and 8, we have the list of names. And he said, cause the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. You see, the common people in those days, and, and, and don't, please forgive me for using that terminology, but that was exactly what it was. The common or the ordinary people, they, they couldn't have afforded the scriptures. And the majority of people didn't have a script, the scriptures or the Bible in, 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 in their own home. And what they did was they went to the synagogue and the scrolls were taken out and they were opened up and they read. And it's only when they went to the temple was the word of God opened up and was it read to the people. And Ezra was the one who opened up the scrolls. He not only brought them, he not only opened them, but he read them. You see, it's one thing to bring it with you, isn't it? It's another thing to open it up. It's a completely different thing to read it. You know, there's some people bring it with them. There's some people open it up and they forget to read it. It's not the reality. I remember my brother telling me, he says, you know, a lot of nights, Mervyn, he, he said, I remember going to bed when I was younger and I remember waking up, he said, my head was on the, on, on the Bible. He said, I had it open, but he said, I never had time to read it. He said, I fell asleep because I was tired. And, and that can be the simple reality, isn't it? But these folks read it and they explained it. They explained it. And I trust folks, and that's always been my endeavor, to read the word. But it's always been my endeavor to explain the word so that people can understand it. I remember a number of years ago, I went to uh, a church in, in, over in Scotland. Uh, <laughs> a number of years ago, I think it must be about 27 or 28 years ago or more. But I remember going in that Sunday morning, I was tired, and uh, the, the minister stood up to preach the word, and he read the word, and then he started to preach it. Now, to keep myself awake, I said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll listen intently now to make sure I understand all he's saying as he explains it. And uh, he stood up. First of all, he used the word I couldn't understand, so I kind of lost him at the start. And then he went on ahead to use a pile of other words I couldn't understand. And I thought to myself, you know, it's probably just me. And I was walking out behind, a, behind a, uh, a mature lady who was walking in front of me. And she turned to the minister and says, Your Reverence, that, that was a great word this morning. Thank you. And I said, of course, I, I couldn't understand a word of it. And there was a fellow with me from the mission, and we, we sat there. And I went out in the car, and I turned, I said, Paul. I said, did you understand a word this morning or was it just me? He said, never understood a word. He says, I thought it was just me. Now, I don't know how on earth that wee woman understood it. 
because I don't think the man who was preaching even understood it himself. But can I say, whenever you stand anywhere, endeavor to explain the word so that people can understand. One of the words there that comes, and I think it's seven times it was said last week, was the people understood. The people understood. And whatever ministry you're involved in for the Lord, make sure the people understood. I was at a mission with this I do finish many years ago and I was preaching and, and nobody was coming forward. And I remember saying to the fellow who was with me, Paul was with me at that time, do they really understand? And after one particular night, a wee girl of 13 years of age came forward and trusted the Lord as her own and personal Savior. And I thought, well, if a child can understand, the rest can understand it as well. It's not a complicated message. God wants you to understand so that you can live it out each and every day. Amen. I know not why God 